Today, we are looking at week six, Relationships, Jesus, Father, and the Followers. Um, next week, we will talk about the rejection, why it was that the Jews, particularly the religious authority of the Jewish people, did not accept Jesus, and we'll look at his passion. Now, when we talk about his last days, the Gospels accounts um, as much, as almost 50%, uh, over 40% at least, of the, of the four Gospels are dedicated to the last week of Jesus' life. So that's a big topic. So we will talk briefly about why Jesus was rejected, but then we will talk about the events that, that were at the very end of his life that led to his death. And then week eight, last week, we will spend the first hour talking about sin and its remedy, uh, the, the fact that Jesus came to save us, and then finally, the final exam. And again, I encourage you to study for and take the final exam because I believe it's a valuable way to make sure you've if you learn the material, um, it certainly isn't going to hurt you to do it if you're not taking this class for, for credit. And if you're taking the class for credit, for either a degree or a certificate, then you're required to take the test and make just a passing grade, which is 65 uh, or more on it. Okay? Pretty easy. Um, if I made this any easier, I couldn't actually call it school. So let's talk now about... Um, I want to start out with the authority of Jesus because I believe that's foundational to the relationship of Jesus with God the Father. <coughs> Jesus was different from any other religious leader that had ever come along in the Jewish people. There had been many rabbis, there had been many people even that had made claims to be Messiah. But Jesus made very specific claims in very specific ways to having authority which could only really be assigned to God. If you were here for the sermon yesterday at Lakeside Presbyterian, I preached on the calming of the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, I didn't hit it very hard in the sermon because I had some other points to make. But the Old Testament talks about the fact that God in heaven controls the wind and the waves. That God, is in, God the Father is in control of the weather. And so the very fact that Jesus was able to do what he did on the Sea of Galilee and stilling the storm was an indication to everyone that he, and that's why he scared the disciples, because they hadn't really sunk into them yet exactly who this was they were dealing with. But Jesus, in many ways, made claims to authority which only God had a right to. First, Jesus claimed the authority to announce and establish the kingdom of God. When, when uh, Jesus talked to both his followers and the Pharisees, he said, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Some of the old translations, like King James, actually translate that wrong and says, With, is within you. It doesn't say, really, is within you. It says the kingdom of God is here in your midst. And Jesus was saying, I am the kingdom of God. I am the personification of the power and the reign and the authority of God himself in the world. And so Jesus uniquely claimed the right to announce and to establish the kingdom of God in his own person. Okay? We also have that Jesus claimed to be the agent of God's final salvation. Um, he was very clear in talking with people about the fact that he was the one who would be the ultimate authority. I'm going to talk about that a little bit as we go along. That through him, the kingdom of God, and therefore God's salvation and God's reign was being instituted into the world. Thirdly, he demonstrated practically his authority by healing uh, and driving out demons. There was nothing that he could not claim to have authority over. That's the storm kind of thing. Yeah, the, the, I think I've said in this class before, the miracles, last week, the miracles that the skeptics have the most trouble accepting are the nature miracles, where he demonstrated his power over the weather, over um, you know, multiplying the loaves and fishes. These are the things people could always say, well, yeah, okay, so Jesus said you're healed and the guy got better. That happens, even though it doesn't even happen like that. Uh, but how you calm the storm, how you walk on water, how you turn loaves and fishes into enough to feed 3,000 or 5,000 people, that's a little different story. And so um, they have a lot of trouble with that. But Jesus demonstrated by his miraculous ministry that he did indeed have authority, which was a divine authority. Um, he also claimed the right to preach and teach by his own divine authority. We talked about that. In fact, Jesus didn't quote some other rabbi. He didn't quote some... Um, ancient tradition. When he did quote the Old Testament, quite frequently he reinterpreted it from what people thought it meant to what it really should have meant. He often said, truly I say to you. 
often it's, um, you have heard it said, but truly I say to you, and in some cases, when he really wants to make a point, he says, truly, truly I say to you. So he claimed the authority that no one else had the willingness or had the sense that they had a right to claim. And he claimed authority over the law. Again, these are things we talked about last week, but I want us to think of them in the context of what they mean in terms of Jesus' relationship with God and God the Father. He claimed to have authority over the law itself and particularly over the Sabbath, which was one of the most important laws. We remember it's one of the Big Ten. The two things that distinguished Jewish people, the two things that made the Jew a Jew, was circumcision and observation of the Sabbath. Everything else might be more emphasized or less emphasized, but those two things absolutely had to be, or a person could not claim to be Jewish. So circumcision was one. The Sabbath. Jesus said he was Lord of the Sabbath. He redefined the understanding of the Sabbath, and that was a claim of authority that he had. Jesus also claimed the ability to forgive sins, which is a doozy. Uh, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity has a wonderful uh, set of comments about this. He says, we've heard it so often, we often forget what it means. And that is the idea that Jesus claimed to forgive sins. Not for sins against himself, but sins generally. And Lewis says, you can understand someone who forgives someone who trods on his toes or takes his money. I forgive you for stepping on my foot or for taking my money. But what would we think of someone, if we really think about what it means, who forgives you for stealing somebody else's money or trotting on somebody else's foot? Think about what authority that implies. Actually, Lewis says, asinine fatuity would be the best thing we could say about that. Okay, if you know what those words mean, come see me at the break. Um, but the idea is Jesus claimed the right to forgive anyone's sins. The man who was paralyzed, who the people dug the hole through the beer door roof, you know, the beer door, and they lowered him down in front of Jesus, and he's paralyzed on his cot there. Um, and Jesus looks down at him and says, my son, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees are freaking out, you know, they don't say anything, but they're like, what? Forgiving sins? What right does this man have to forgive sins? That's blasphemy. Jesus, who knew what they were thinking, said, tell me which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk. But just so that you know the Son of Man, Jesus, has power and authority to forgive sins, he looks down at the man and says, take up your bed and walk. And the man stands up and takes up his bed and walks. Jesus performed that miracle in order to demonstrate that the first thing he said, your sins are forgiven, he really did have the authority to do that. Nobody else had ever even suggested that they had the right to do that, to forgive sins committed against someone else. Jesus did, and that obviously is a sign of his divine authority. And you'll stop me if you've got questions about any of this, right? You should know that by now. Uh, Jesus claimed that every person's eternal destiny was based on relationship with him. Again, an astonishing thing, and we read it so many times we don't realize how staggering that is. But he said, for instance, in Mark 8, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. He goes on to say, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words, <coughs> excuse me, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Jesus plainly said, what you think of me, whether or not you accept me, will determine your eternal fate. Talk about a claim of authority, right? Jesus also said <coughs> that in the final judgment, he would be the one that would set in judgment. He would be the authority. Again, the Son of Man will, will be ashamed of you, <coughs> excuse me, will be ashamed of that person when they come before the Father's glory with all the angels. So, um, Jesus is going to be the final judge. All of these are ways in which Jesus very clearly claimed that he was not just another God. He was not just a teacher. Um, he, there was something else going on here. And so, what exactly, based upon all of this, do we think that Jesus was trying to accomplish? Have you ever thought about asking that question? What was he trying to do? You know, he came to earth, offended everybody who had power, got himself killed, and then was resurrected and ascended. What was he trying to accomplish? We could go on at great length about this, but I want to identify three different things. 
all of which have to do with his authority. First, as we've said several times, and if you haven't picked this up, then either I'm doing a really horrible job or you're not listening. The major theme of Jesus' ministry was the kingdom of God. That is the power and sovereignty and reign and authority of God over all of his creation. And Jesus came both to institute the new uh, era of the kingdom, the already but not yet. Jesus coming to earth instituted the kingdom of God on earth. It has not yet been fulfilled and will not be until he returns. But Jesus came to announce and to begin the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, was the prayer. So that's one thing. The establishment or the start of the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. Secondly, he came to provide a means for forgiveness of sin and for reconciliation back to God. Ultimately, um, and most of you have heard me talk about this, the Christian uh, faith is very simply, we were made in the image of God and we were made for a relationship with Him. That's why we were made. That is the hunger that everyone feels. That's the, Augustine said, the God-shaped vacuum that exists in the heart of every person. Okay? We all were made for a relationship with God, but that relationship was broken by sinfulness. We are inadequate to pay the price to clean ourselves up. And so God Himself in the person of His Son, Jesus, came to earth paid the price for our sins so that we could be reconciled back to God. The idea is we're on earth, God is in heaven, there's a chasm, the bridge was broken, we are unable to build the bridge ourselves, but God is, so God did. He sent His Son so that the reconciliation, the, the Son who was both fully God and fully man, could once again unite humanity with the Father who made them and loved them. And so that's what Christianity is all about, and Jesus came in order to institute that plan in order to allow a means by which our sin could be forgiven we could be made whole and holy before a righteous father and we could be back in relationship with him that's what the Christian faith is all about that's what the human story is all about there isn't anything more important you're ever going to hear than that it's not because I'm saying it, it's because that's the way it is okay and thirdly, he came to create a community of faith to usher in this new kingdom age. The reason today we're talking about relationships, Jesus, the Father, and the followers, is exactly because, maybe it should be the Father, Jesus, and the followers, because Jesus is the connecting material. Jesus is the bridge. He reflects the divinity of God the Father and the authority that he carries as the Son of God. But he, then he called forward a community of believers. And especially um, love, selected them, loved them, trained them, prepared them to usher in the kingdom by creating and establishing the church. Jesus did not create the church while he was on earth. He prepared the apostles and the disciples, we'll talk about those different words in a little while, to, for them to start the church. The, the birthday of the church, the launch of the church was, on, was in the second chapter of Acts on the day of Pentecost, which was after Jesus' ascension. So the church was begun after Jesus went back into heaven. But he had laid the groundwork by preparing his people, the community of believers, to launch the church. Okay? So I think those three things, again, we can make a longer list than that, but those three are the primary things that Jesus was trying to accomplish, and that he did accomplish, he was successful, when he came to earth. Any questions about that? Glad you could join us. I don't think you even heard me. Hi, Bob. <laughs> All right. Um, let's step back now and talk about the relationship of Jesus to God the Father. We've listed a number of ways in which Jesus claimed authority. Um, and all of them reflect his divine nature, I believe. But let's talk specifically based upon his life and his comments on his relationship to the God the Father. First, we need to recognize that Jesus consistently described God with one word, and that is Father. Father, the word Father occurs 150 times in the Gospels, in the four Gospels. Actually, it's over 150 times. The first recorded words we have of Jesus when he was 12 years old and he stayed behind at the temple and his parents, you know, didn't weren't aware he wasn't in the in the caravan going home and they came back and a freaking out looking for him and he said didn't you why are you worried didn't you 
know that I must be about my father's business. Some translations say I, I must be in my father's house, and actually the words could be translated either way legitimately. But, but either way, Jesus' first recorded words have to do with his acknowledgement of God as his father. His last words from the cross are, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. So Jesus used Father as not only the, the title for God, but clearly there's a conceptual understanding behind that. That's what we're going to talk about here a little bit. God was sometimes perceived as Father in the Old Testament. The Jews sometimes thought of God as Father, but not in a personal sense. You remember that Jesus not only used the word Father, he used the word Abba, which is an Aramaic word. It's a very familiar word for Father. It's, it's Daddy. The best translation is Daddy. Um, when Jesus was praying, he referred to God the Father as Daddy. There was, there's never anywhere in the Old Testament any sense of that kind of intimacy, of that, that kind of thinking of God as Father. Um, instead, the few times, there's not a lot of them, but the few times that God is referred to in a fatherly sense in the Old Testament, it is that God is the Father of the nation of Israel. Not a personal father, certainly not a daddy, Abba, but rather that he is the father of the Jewish people, that they are his children as a nation, not individually. Okay? Still, in the Old Testament, there are suggestions, sort of inklings, of more intimacy, or at least a desire for more intimacy. So there is kind of a preparation that occurs in the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms. For instance, in Psalm 68, uh, God is referred to as the father of the fatherless. And then in Psalm 103, it says, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who, love, who fear him. Excuse me. Um, so there's this... It's almost as though they, they wouldn't allow themselves to go any further than just God is the father of uh, the nation of Israel, but there's always these inklings that they want more, you know, that they're desiring more, that they want, they want to be more intimate in their relationship with God, but can never really bring themselves to it. And the, the, the very Jewish understanding was that God had to be held in a more formal way. Of course, they couldn't even say the name of God. We talked about the, when we talked about the kingdom of God, Mark, Luke, and John talk about the kingdom of God. Matthew, the most Jewish of all of them, will not even say the kingdom of God. He says the kingdom of heaven. Because of this idea that you've got to be formal with God. The idea of him being father or, you know, heaven forbid, daddy, is something that the Jews simply were not comfortable with prior to Jesus. And he introduced to a great extent, this idea that God is our Father in a real, fatherly, family kind of way. Now, Jesus' teaching about God as Father was original in two particular ways that we can see. The first is that he made God's fatherhood the very central perception of God. Now, he didn't deny God's holiness, God's righteousness, God's justice, God's wrath, God's potential judgment. He didn't deny any of that. But all of those fell far behind the primary conception that Jesus used for God, and that was Father. Whereas the Old Testament Jews were unwilling to hardly even think about it, even though they seemed to desire it, Jesus put everything else as secondary or tertiary to the idea of God as Father. That's why it occurs 150 times. And that doesn't include the Abba references, by the way. Secondly, he imbued the understanding of God as Father with a richness that could only come from a, the fact that he was the son of the Father. That he, both in his words and particularly in how he lived his life, reflected a perfect union between Father and Son. The ideal union, you know, God the Father to Jesus is the kind of Father that everybody knows they want to have. And so Jesus reflected, again, both in his words and in his actions, how, we, how he prayed to the Father, for instance, the prayer life of Jesus, that um, this, is, this is what a father and child relationship ought to look like. Okay? Um, and that was very different. The fact that he said father at all was amazing, but that he made it so much central, and that he reflected that in his own relationship with God the Father. So, in what way did Jesus, in what ways particularly, did Jesus teach the idea of God as Father? Um, I think, uh, first, 
He taught that God the Father is vitally interested in his children's concerns. Again, the God of the Old Testament, while, while a person, you know, there was a personal sense, you know, God was a, a being you could relate to, you couldn't, be, you couldn't get too close to him because he was God and you were not. And he was the great God Almighty, the creator in heaven. You know, we talk in classes about the, the nature of God being that he is both transcendent, that is different from us and far away from us, and he is also eminent, he is close to us. Well, the Old Testament Jews emphasized by far the transcendence of God. That he is God in heaven, he's different from us, he's greater than us, you know, don't, don't try to get too close. Jesus made it very clear that God the Father is eminent to us. He is close to us. And not only that, He cares about us. He wants to be involved in the lives of His children. Matthew 7, 9-11, um, Jesus said, If you then, though you were evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good, give good gifts to those who ask Him? The Jews would have thought that was, that was uh, horrendously informal. And yet, over and over, Jesus talks about God the Father, is that He wants to be fatherly to us. He wants to treat us like beloved children. This is how Jesus describes God the Father. A very different kind of idea, that He is interested, vitally interested, in the concerns of His children. Secondly, Jesus taught that God knows and loves us as individual souls. Again, to the Old Testament Jews, the idea was that God was the Father over the nation of Israel. <clears throat> the high priest every year on the Day of Atonement would go into the Holy of Holies and he would pour the sacrificial blood on the, on the seat of mercy um, in order to request forgiveness for the sins of the whole people. And yes, individuals were required particular times to do individual sacrifices for their families, etc. But for the most part, there's this idea that God, if he's Father at all, he's Father to all of us, but not to me individual so much. That's again a little too informal for the Jews. And Jesus broke down all those barriers. Yes. Is that the day I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood? Mm -hmm. Is that the day they were supposed to go to the ocean and throw everything in their pockets into the ocean? I've never heard of forgiveness of sins. It was for the forgiveness of sins. Was it the Day of Atonement? The Day of Atonement is yeah, I've never heard of going to the ocean and throwing stuff. Because um, he said he used to make sure he had no money in his pockets and his yo yo and all that. Leave his yo yo at home. Okay. Uh, it sounds like Mark Twain got a hold of him. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's something Tom Sawyer would convince him to do. No, I don't know. I've never heard of that tradition. Uh, but the Day of Atonement is the most somber, the most serious day. It is the day for recognizing the sins of the people and asking for forgiveness. Um, but that's an interesting one. I would like to learn more about that. A um, couple, of, couple of scriptures that relate to that. Matthew 10.30 says that God knows even the very hairs of your head that they are numbered. This idea that God the Father is paying attention to me, you know, he says, you, you know, God knows when a sparrow falls from the air, and you are so much more valuable to him than a sparrow. He knows even every hair on your head. Every hair on your head is numbered. For some of us, that's a much quicker job than for others. Barbara, I knew you were thinking that. I can see it on your face. Um, but... The idea that he's personally, individually concerned with me and with my needs. He wants to be my father, my father, not just the father of all of us. Okay? And then secondly, from Luke 15, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go out to the lost sheep until he finds it? There are a number of parables like that where Jesus is emphasizing the fact that God isn't just concerned about the crowd. In fact, he will go to great lengths to care for the individual if the individual gets separated from the crowd. The lost coin, the lost sheep, all of those parables are about the fact that God cares about you. One, that was completely new. No one else had ever presented God in that way. That he cares about us and he cares about us individually. And also, Jesus presented that God is our loving Father, and because He's our loving Father, we can come to Him as His children, and not just with formality. The Jewish faith was very formal. You had priests, you had high priests, you had official sacrifices, and it was all very ritualized. There was no, the least formal thing that the Jews would do would be the, the Shabbat prayers at home. When they would light the candles and they would say the prayers and they would, they would recognize 
the great uh, deliverance that God had allowed them under Moses. But still, there's a very formalized, ritualized kind of approach. Jesus presented a father whom we could come to, not in ritual, but with our hearts and with our needs, and that we could talk to informally, whom we could call Abba, Daddy. For instance, Matthew 7, 7, and 8, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. And knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. To the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Not, okay, bring a ram and a spotless sheep and two pigeons and a quart of flour and, you know, an ephah of oil. And here's the, act, the very particular way you're supposed to cut them up, roast them, eat this part, give this part to the priest, pour this out there, do, you know, all of this stuff. Jesus just sort of bypassed all of that and said, do you want something from God? Ask him, Abba, Father. Completely different understanding in terms of the relationship with God. Now, the idea of Jesus as the Son of God, what he is teaching us, basically, is that we can have the same kind of relationship with God the Father that he was able to have. When they said, that when the disciples said to him, I'll talk about that in a minute, um, teach us to pray, it was because they had heard him praying and know that the way he prayed was not the way they had been taught to pray. And they said, teach us to pray the way you pray. To pray to the Father in, in, with the informality and, the, and the, uh, the affection and the relationship and the trust that we hear in your voice. Not the, the formality of, you know, a ritualized kind of approach. And Jesus said, well, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. A very direct, informal approach to God, which they had never heard before. Okay? Any questions about that? You see where this is going? Okay. Um, let's continue this idea. In what other ways did Jesus teach the idea of God as Father? This is one that might surprise you. Jesus' teaching of God as the Father means that pain has meaning. What does that mean? Well, the Old Testament perception was that if, if, you, if things were going well for you, then God was blessing you. You were in his favor. If things went badly for you, if you got sick, if you lost money, whatever it was, that means you did something wrong and God is judging you. Very simplistic approach. Jesus introduced the idea, and then his followers understood this and picked it up later, that there may be other reasons exactly because God is our Father, our intimate Father who cares about us and wants to be involved in our lives, there may be other reasons why we experience pain. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, who I think was Priscilla, a woman, uh, always got to keep throwing that in there, wrote this in Hebrews 12, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children, for what children are not disciplined by their fathers? A very different understanding of why it is we might experience pain in our lives. It may very well be that God sends trials to us in order to strengthen us, in order to correct us, but not because he wants to hurt us or punish us, but because he wants us to do better. He wants us to learn, and let's face it, sometimes that's the only way that he can get our attention. C.S. Lewis said, suffering is the megaphone by which God gets our attention quite often. Not always, but quite often. Some pain is just part of what life is. Okay? There is some pain that is just the nature of being fallen creatures in a fallen world. But quite often, we need to understand that pain may be God's way of trying to help us. There had not been that conception before Jesus. And he taught it to his followers, and we find it reflected in the New Testament. Gary? Isn't, isn't the example you gave before saying the exact opposite, where they lowered the, the person that couldn't walk through the roof, and the first thing Jesus said is, I forgive your sins, mm -hmm. which implies the implication that you were crippled because you sinned. Not necessarily. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. 
I think those are two distinct things, and Jesus wanted to make a point. Um, I don't think he necessarily is saying you're paralyzed because you're a sinner. Because when he said your sins are forgiven, the guy wasn't healed then. It was only when Jesus said, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk, but just so you know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, take up your bed and walk. So the, I don't think there's a necessary connection between sinning and having difficulty. Now the Jews would have thought it was. You know, the man, the man born blind, um, who sinned? You or yeah, who God. sinned? You or your parents? I mean, they thought that somebody had to sin for somebody to be born blind, and Jesus said neither. But rather, this man was born blind so that the glory of God could be demonstrated, and then he heals him. I think that's very much what Jesus was doing. You know, he wanted to make a point to show he could forgive sins, because anybody can say that. That's easy to say. But he not only said that and meant it, but he then did something nobody else could do. Cured him. He, he uh, cured him from his paralysis. Okay, I don't think there is a necessary connection to the, between those two. Does that make sense? You see what I'm saying? Well, he, 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 he was doing that for the Pharisees. If what you said now makes sense. Yes, I think he was wanting to make a point. The same reason he said the man born blind was born blind in order to be able to demonstrate God's glory, and then he healed him to make a point. Um, I think there was compassion involved too in both of those cases. He was compassion. He had compassion for the man paralyzed and the man born blind. But it wasn't, there's not a necessary connection between the man having sinned and him being paralyzed. Okay. Um, right. Same as the tower that I think his disciples asked, the tower fell on some people. Yes, right. There had been a case where a tower fell and killed a bunch of people, and they said, well, that, was that their fault? And Jesus is saying, basically, he says, you need to get away from this idea that every time something bad happens, it's because somebody did something wrong. That's not the way it works. That's. The, the Jews had extrapolated from God's instruction in the Old Testament, and they'd gone way overboard on that idea. Um, well, what's funny is how you could read the book of Job and come away with that idea. Yeah, you could read the book of Job if you listen to Job's opponents and come away right. with that idea, because that's right. what Job's opponents, but Job kept saying over and over again, I have not done anything wrong. My suffering is not because I'm a sinner, because I have not done anything wrong. You know, God, you want to explain this to me, please? Because I know I have not sinned against you. His wife says to him, okay, just curse God and die. And he went, no. Are we going to accept good things from God's hand and not bad things too? Let's be fair about this. I will accept that this is from God. I'm not going to curse God. I'm not going to blame God. But I'm going to ask God to help me understand this. Because I know I haven't done anything wrong. So the whole people read Job, and again, particularly if they read the, his three opponents, the three people who were supposedly friends of his, and they're all saying exactly that. Well, you must have done something really horrible, Job, for this to have happened to you. But Job consistently is saying, no, I didn't do anything wrong. I don't know why all of this has come on me, but it's not because I have sinned. And God restores Job in the end because that was true. First, he makes it clear to Job by the way, Job, when you ask me questions like this, you do know that I'm God and you're not. Were you there when I stretched the arch of the universe? You know? Were you there when I hung the stars in the sky? Were you there when the angels sang at the moment of creation? Really, were you? Because if you were, then you can ask me those kinds of questions. But otherwise, you need to understand that I'm God and you're not. But then, God proves that Job had been right by restoring him and his his family and his health and his uh, his wealth because again they thought if you're rich God loves you if you're poor God hates you Job actually if you read it correctly if you read the whole thing says quite the opposite yep. Kenneth first and then Marvin okay Marvin I especially like when Job says I've seen wicked men live to an old age with their children and wealthy and so on and so forth and he says and, and what about this visiting their sins on their children. Let them suffer. Why, why don't they have to exactly. suffer? Exactly. Yeah. Sins? Absolutely. Yep. And, and Jesus said, when we start trying to decide bad things are because you were a bad person, good things are because you're a good person, he said it rains on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. Meaning you can't divide it up that way. Right? I, I've known people, Carolyn and I had a friend, who used to always gripe about the fact that unrighteous people were getting rich and she was having trouble paying her bills. Well, there was more than a little pride in that <laughs> for one day. But 
I don't know how many times I've said it. Teresa, scriptures, Jesus was very clear that it does, you know, we can't cut it that way. You can't draw a line there and understand how that works. It rains on the righteous and unrighteous. Um, and Jesus was making that point that don't always think that if you have pain, if you, if you have difficulty, if you have suffering, it's because God doesn't love you. Maybe it's because He especially loves you. And this is, as hard as it may be, and I'm not, I'm not trying to, to gloss over what pain is, what grief is, but it may be that He is actually using that for your benefit. I know people who don't believe in spanking their children, and their children are little monsters. <laughs> All right? I will, you know, and I, I know there's a lot of complicated things there, but when Scripture says, spare the rod and spoil the child, which it does say, actually it says, he who hates the rod, or hates his child will spare the rod. Um, I think there's some truth in that. When it says that uh, God is treating you as his children, for what children are not disciplined by their father, well, the children who are disciplined by their father end up going in a bad way quite often. God may be doing this in order to make us better in some way, because he loves us. And we don't want to hear that. <laughs> help me go on the way I, I want to go by helping me win a lot, the lottery, God. You know, that'll help. You know, that's not the way it always works. What's that? You've got to buy a ticket first. You've got to buy a ticket first, right. Remember that story. So. Um, all right, another way in which Jesus taught the idea of God as Father is that God is the loving Father changes completely the understanding that had existed about sin and forgiveness. The idea that sin means breaking a law, instead Jesus introduced the idea that sin is to betray the love that God has shown for you. It's a betrayal of relationship, more than it is just breaking of some law. You know, laws are, are impersonal, informal things. Somebody wrote them down sometime, we don't, we don't have any sense of a personal thing. That's not the extent. Yes, the law was written in the Old Testament, but more than that, Jesus introduced the idea that we are betraying a Father who loves us when we defy His will. Likewise, forgiveness does not become just penal satisfaction. In other words, we satisfy the penal code, we satisfy the, the punishment requirement. But more, it becomes compassionate reconciliation, that we can be reconciled because God has shown compassion to us. And the perfect example of that is the parable of the prodigal son. And you know the parable. The prodigal <coughs> son goes, decides that he doesn't want to have to wait to receive his, uh, put the rest of it up here. He doesn't want to have to wait to receive his, his inheritance. So he asks his father for his, his inheritance. He gives it to him. And he goes off into a foreign land and squanders all his money. And he ends up uh, having to feed pigs to, to survive. And wishing that he could eat the slop that he's having to feed the pigs because he's so hungry. And for Jew to take care of pigs was the ultimate, the ultimate of degradation. And so finally the son says, you know, my, my father's servants back at home are living better than I am. I'll go back to my father and tell him, just let me be one of your servants. Forget about the son thing. In other words, I will pay a penalty in order to be allowed back into the family. And so we have the story of the return of the prodigal son here from Luke 15. But while he, the prodigal son, was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled, what, with anger at him? With judgment against him? With upset that he was showing back up after all he'd done? No. His father was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. This parable, and other things Jesus said, but this parable most pointedly completely changes the idea of what sin and of forgiveness are. Sin is not the breaking of some static law for which there must be some penalty paid in order for us to be okay again. The shedding of blood, for instance, the sacrificing of spotless animals or whatever else, you know, how, there are other ways you can define that. 
Instead, sin is a broken relationship. And forgiveness is a compassionate reconciler. That's the story of the prodigal son and his father, who had every right to deny his shamefully prodigal son. And he didn't. He loved him and took him back and celebrated his return. Do you see that as a model for sin and forgiveness? And why Jesus told that parable? It is a beautiful change. Very different than what the Old Testament tend, the Old Testament Jews tend to think of. And it had to do with understanding who the Father is. The Father is a loving Father who wants to be in a relationship with you and will do everything He can if you'll, if you'll be willing to present yourself to Him. Not just that God is looking to punish you because you acted badly. Ron. Mary and I came across an interesting study about the prodigal father. Mm -hmm. Giving too much, not bad. Loving so much. It was the other understanding of prodigals. You know, so much. Like reckless spending. Yeah, reckless spending to reckless mm -hmm. giving. Uh, were they applying that to the prodigal son story, or are they were applying it to other fathers? Because I think it's a, it's a misinterpretation of apply to the prodigal son. Um, there's no indication, I mean, other than giving him what his inheritance was, there's no indication that, you know, that the prodigal son was spoiled in some way up until the fact that his father gave him his inheritance. I said, you know, you're an adult, you can do what you want, I'll give you this. Um, I think there are prodigal fathers today in terms of, of spending too much, giving too much, you know, not, not being disciplined to their, with their children. I think that's a problem. But if people apply it to this, I think that's a wrong interpretation. Yes, they were trying in this one to, to say the giving was in accepting the son back. Mm -hmm. Such okay. overwhelming giving of love. Right. Yeah. So it, is, it was that's sort of true. interesting. That's true. Yeah. yeah, I don't think I would blame the prodigal father, uh, the father for the sins of the prodigal son, though, yeah. if that's what they were trying to do. Okay, no, no, no. good. Uh, first, Marvin? Yes. You're probably going to go the right way, but I like the next part where the brother says, well, <laughs> you, know, you never gave me to that account. Yeah. And he's teaching us to also forgive. Yeah. And not judge because of that person. That... The brother does not respond well. Right. Um, you know, he's saying, wait a minute, I've been here the whole time working for you, and when my friend, friends and I get together for a party, you don't give us the padded calf. You know, well, we got to eat goat meat uh, kind of thing. And yet, and the father says, you don't get it. You know, your, your brother was dead, in effect, to us. And now he's alive again. And that's wonderful, and we should all celebrate. Okay, Becky? Um, I had uh, said this earlier, and um, there was a, a pastor that compared the two sons as, like, um, mm -hmm. the son that left as, like, the sinner, and, of course, the un like, we don't deserve the unconditional love. And then the other son was, like, the self-righteous one who still wanted the inheritance, he thought he was self-righteous, he should get everything. Yeah. Um, so it was like the the Christian, the self-righteous Christian, and the, the, the son that is the sinner. Right. Um, the idea that I've acted right, so I, sh I deserve yeah. it. <laughs> well, you know what? We haven't acted right. And when we think that we're righteous, that's when we really have a problem. That's when we're really missing it. If you say you're without sin, and you're a liar, and the truth is not in you, John said. Kenneth, did you have something else? Well, you know, but it's interesting to find that, of course, as you get older, it is sometimes really easy to be in their older son's position. Oh, yeah. I, I had a friend who, she was sharing one day, her, si her sister had committed adultery twice with two different pastors. Their, their, their marriages had ended. She had married one of them, and... She said, my husband and I have tried to stay faithful. We've worked and we've struggled along financially. And you look at them living this sin, or they, you know, but they supposedly repent, come back to the church, and now they're blessed so abundantly, making tons of money. And she said, it's hard for me not to be the older brother. Yeah. You know? It is hard. And ultimately, the only thing we can say is, that's not our call. Right. They're not our servant. Then, so... God will do what He will do. God will not be mocked. And it is not for us to judge because we ain't able. <laughs> right. Not accurately, anyway. We think we can judge, but we can't. So. But I think along the same lines as that whole thing, a whole concept I never thought about 
was how do you, how does God feel about us now, or how does He feel about me personally? And it wasn't until I was con really confronted with that idea that I was able to really grasp the affection that mm -hmm. God really has for me, and it's there all through the Scripture. But you just it's so easy to pass over it yeah. and just totally miss it. And it's also there. I mean, once we are reconciled with God by accepting what Jesus has done for us. The realization that um, we have the opportunity then to be in relationship with God. That the Holy Spirit dwells in us, and in that way we're in relationship. The fact that God the Father is available to us uh, for relationship and community through prayer at <coughs> any time, for any length of time, um, it is a very different setting. And, and so the promise that God has made that relationship is available to us doesn't always mean we take advantage of it in the way that we should, but He loves us that much. He wants us to be. He wants to be there. He is there for us whenever we are willing to put ourselves out there, but we're too busy doing something else too often. Becky? Well, to me, I was just thinking of, of that song from back in the 70s or something. It was called, How Deep Is Our Love? How Deep Is Our right. is, How Deep Is God's Love? How Deep Is His Compassion? How Far Does It Go? Yep. Both ways. Yeah, infinite. Well, and that brings us to the last point I want to make here about how Jesus taught the idea of God the Father, and that is, He taught that if God is our Father, then all of us are brothers and sisters. And the best example of that is our Father, who art in heaven. He is the Father of all of us who seek Him, who pray to Him, who have, through Jesus Christ, accepted the relationship back to the Father. We are brothers and sisters. Uh, those of you in the church history class have heard me talk about the fact that this is one of the things that got the early Christians in trouble is because they were so emphatic in the fact that they were all brothers and sisters. Even married couples saw themselves as brother and sister, and they would call each other brother and sister. So the early Christians were accused of incest. They thought that family members were, you know, marrying each other and doing all sorts of wrong things, even though the Romans did that sort of thing all the time. Uh, marry each other, I mean, you know, brothers and sisters especially in royal families, would marry each other to try to keep their line pure. We, know what, we now know what that does to the line, okay, um, genetically. But this idea that when we recognize God as our Father in an individual, in an intimate way, in that He is involved and desires to be involved in our lives, then that takes us to a, the very next understanding is that all of us who claim Him as Father are therefore brothers and sisters. And it changes our relationship to other people. Doesn't mean your brothers and sisters are perfect. You know, they may be really messed up, but they're still your brothers and sisters, which means you should have a different attitude toward them than you would have had otherwise. It changes. When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He, of course, said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. In other words, God is the Father that we have a relationship with. And the second commandment, they only asked him for one, but he gave him two. It was a twofer. Uh, the second commandment is like it that you should love your neighbor as yourself. If God is our Father and we're worshiping Him, then our brothers and sisters we should love as well. And even if people aren't followers of Jesus, they're potentially our brothers and sisters. So let's do what we can do to love them in that way, that they might come into the family. It's a very uh, clear connection there. Why did you have something? No. Okay, just scratching your head. Yes. Yeah, if, anytime anybody's hand gets above their neck level, I'm <laughs> not probably going to call them Marvin. <laughs> Again, from Joel, uh, uh, Lionel, I think, said to Joel, take a look at the clouds and tell me what you can do to affect them yep. at all. And he says, what you do doesn't affect God. Yeah. What you do affects your brothers and your sisters. Yeah. You, you have an effect on people, but not on God. And so we can say how much we love God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, but we can only show it by how we react right. to our brothers. Yes, yeah. very true. Anything else about this? Okay, let's take a break for a few minutes. Uh, we will come back at five minutes after two. Let's talk now about some of the titles of Jesus. They refer to these as messianic titles. There are several of them. And messianic because each of them, in a slightly different way, are titles that were used by Jesus of himself or by other people for Jesus that indicate some aspect of his messianic nature or of his divinity. And they're very telling. There's a lot that we can develop from understanding these, but then there's all, it's also true that some of the great misunderstandings about the nature of Jesus 
has been because people have drawn the wrong conclusion from what some of these titles mean. I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, the first title, which has significance for us, is that Jesus was the Christ. A lot of people, I'm sure, think that Christ is Jesus' last name. It is not. Uh, it's a title. The word Christ is the, is the Greek version of the word Messiah, or Mashiach in Hebrew. So Hebrew Messiah, um, Greek, Christ, both of them mean the anointed one. And anointed is uh, what they did for the kings. Every king in Israel was anointed. So the, this title establishes the fact that Jesus was seen by many people, and I believe claimed for himself, that he was the fulfillment of the Jewish expectation for God's promised king and redeemer. We've talked a lot in classes, and it's a really important thing for us to remember when we think about uh, how Jesus was perceived and what role he filled in the first century, that the Jewish people had been expecting for at least 1,200 years, maybe more, for God to send a Messiah, a uh, Redeemer, would be God's representative. It was especially the case after King David, around the year 1000. King David is the king that made Israel great. God had promised to King David that someone will sit on the throne of Israel from your line forever. And yet, we had periods of time in which the Israelites were conquered and defeated and even sent off into exile. So the expectation was always that God would uh, finally fulfill his promise and send another King David, another leader for Israel that would make them great again the way King David had. And that God would, would send this person as his anointed one, his new king. That's what the Messiah meant. And the messianic expectation for the Jews was a primary driving force. The Jews had been expecting the Messiah for as long as anybody could remember. And so the question was always asked, you know, is this him? Various people had come along and claimed to be the Messiah. People, tried, people wondered whether John the Baptist was the Messiah. Is he the one that God sent? Is he the one that's going to lead us? And particularly they expected that the Messiah would drive out the oppressors. And during Jesus' time, of course, the oppressors were the Romans. So the expectation was that whoever the Messiah was, if it was Jesus, then one of Jesus' primary jobs was to drive out the Romans. Obviously, Jesus didn't do that. Because Jesus, part of his message was that what you expect of the Messiah is not what the Messiah is actually going to bring, or do, or be. An example of a passage that gives us the messianic expectation, as well as introduces one of the other um, titles, is the testimony of Peter in Caesarea Philippi. Jesus had asked the disciples, who do other people say that I am? And they said, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist come back from the dead, some say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And then Jesus asked the all-important question. And this is the passage we have from Matthew, Matthew 16. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter, always the one to talk. Simon Peter couldn't keep his mouth shut if you paid him. <laughs> Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah. There it is. The Son of the living God. So we got, again, a twofer here. Peter identifies Jesus as the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christ, the one the Jews had been waiting for for so very long, who would reestablish the nation of Israel as once again great. But Peter then goes further and identifies the testimony that Jesus is also the Son of the living God. So Son of God comes into this. But this messianic expectation, it's like the Jews had been holding their breath for a thousand years, waiting for the Messiah to come. And Jesus comes and fulfills the Messiah, but not in the way they expected, nor in the way most of the Jews could accept. Okay? So Christ or Messiah. Question about that? I'll call on you if you clear your throat, too. Uh, yes? I'm just curious. Had Jesus used that he was the Son of the living God, was saying that he was the Son of God before Peter said that? Um, Jesus had not. In fact, Jesus never says that about himself, although he answers in the affirmative when somebody asks him. The high priest said, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Because again, they wouldn't even say God. 
you know, um, the, the even, they're reluctant to even use a generic term. And Jesus said, yes, I am. And you will see the Son of Man, we'll talk about the Son of Man in a minute, uh, coming in the clouds of glory. So Jesus responded positively. He did not correct Peter here. He did not correct Thomas after Thomas doubted Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, um, and then finally sees the resurrected Jesus. Thomas falls down and says, my Lord and my God. So Jesus never corrected or denied or sidestepped when somebody else claimed, but he didn't use that term for himself. We'll talk for him in a minute about why that is, I think. Okay. All right, another... Oh, I'm already there. Another term which is closely related to the Messiah title is Son of David. I told you that people expected Messiah would be a descendant of David, but also like David in that he would create nation, the nation of Israel uh, to be great again, as it had been under David. So Son of David is another way of saying the Messiah, and it's a way of acknowledging the fact that this is a descendant of David, because the promise was that a descendant of David would sit on the throne of Israel. Several examples here. Um, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him. This is when Jesus is up around Tyre and Sidon on the Phoenician coast. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Now by saying a Canaanite woman, it means she's not a Jew. She's a Gentile. And so even the Gentiles understood that... There was a Jewish expectation for a Messiah, that there would be a son of David, a king, because the Jews were, you know, a dominant force in the part of the for a long time by then. She was not Jewish, she was Gentile, but she was living in the part of the world where the Jews were a dominant force, and she knew the idea of the Messiah being a son of David. This is the woman who, when she said, my daughter's suffering terribly, please heal her, Jesus said, uh, I have to take care of the children before I worry about the dogs. And she responded very wisely, but even the dogs under the table get to pick up the crumbs. And Jesus said, for that smart answer, your daughter is healed. Joanne? Did um, the Gentiles have access to the Old Testament very often? Um, they would have because it was in Greek, okay. you know, by this time, uh, for 300, almost 300 years, 270 years or so. Um, the Hebrew scripture had been available in the Greek form, the Septuagint, so they certainly could have read it. And remember that there were a lot, uh, we talked about the God-fearing Jews, which show up quite a bit in the New Testament. These were Gen or God -fearing Gentiles, excuse me. These were Gentiles who were fed up with the whole mono the, the polytheistic idea, the gods of the Romans and the gods of the Greeks, this idea that you can have as many gods as you want, you know, it's all right to add another one. That had become bankrupt, and spiritually bankrupt to people, and they said, this doesn't do anything for us. And so a lot of Gentiles were looking for a one true God. They were looking for a monotheistic belief. The only place you could look was to the Jews. That was the only monotheistic religion. And so you did have non-Jews who were attracted to the Jewish faith because of the monotheism. As we said before, one of the problems was you had this cadre of God-fearing Gentiles who would love to have become Jews, except particularly for the men, the idea that you become a Jew, you have to have part of your anatomy cut off. You can't eat bacon, you can't eat shellfish. Okay, the expectations are a little higher. We like the general idea, but we are not going to go along with all the laws, all the rules. So when Christianity came along, believing in the same God, but without all the rules, there was immediately a built-in uh, target audience that was very open to the Christian message. That was one of the reasons the church grew quickly. Aaron. Um, they wouldn't have had their own copies. Would they have to go to the synagogue, or did they have their own? Well, because of the fact that there was a, a strong Hellenizing, uh, Hellenized Christian community, it was likely that the Septuagint was available elsewhere. For instance, Septuagint was written in Alexandria, in Egypt. And so the Library of Alexandria would have had copies. It would probably have been that in any of the centers of learning, like Antioch, which was a large city, you probably, now, you know, there was no publishing. Any, anytime you found a book, somebody had to have copied it by hand. So that means there weren't a lot of them out there. You just didn't pop down to Barnes & Noble and brought, buy a copy of the Septuagint. But any, anyone who was really looking probably could have found a copy somewhere. That they would not have been allowed in the synagogue or the temple because Gentiles were not allowed in there. But as I say, 
centers of learning. The reason they did it in Alexandria is because Alexandria had a big Jewish population. It was known for scholarship. And so they invited 70 scholars down from Jerusalem to Alexandria. That's where the translation took place. And at one time, the library in Alexandria was the largest repository of learning and knowledge in the world until it got burned down. Uh, and so there probably would have been locations where if somebody were really, really desiring this, they could find a copy of the Septuagint okay. in the language they could read. How many people were literate? Uh, well, amongst the Jewish people, pretty much all of them. Mm -hmm. Because the Jews, that's one of the things about the Jews, that's one of the reasons that they were respected by the Romans, by Alexander when he came through, is they taught their children to read and write. And in terms of a literate population, they were far higher percentage than anyone else. I mean, in fact, it would have been almost unheard of to not be able to read and write if you're Jewish. Okay. Um, other peoples, depends upon their level of wealth, okay? How, how well to do they were. So, but th that's one of the things about the Jews is that they required literacy. And that's, that's one of the things that held them together as people, is they always had the book. In fact, I think I've said before in some of the classes, if you go back and look at the religions that have lasted, and by religions, I mean true religions as well as false religions, even the false ones, even the cults, the ones that have lasted, what's one characteristic that they all have in common? They have a book. The, the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith, uh, the writings of Mary Baker Eddy for the Christian scientists, you know, um, Dianetics. <laughs> Dianetics, okay. Um, the idea is that it is the having of a book is one of the things that gives people a sense of identity. Well, one of the reasons the Jews always maintained their identity so thoroughly is they were all literate and they all had, they were all people of the book. Okay, Marvin? Uh, the oral tradition was a lot stronger than the Jew, and a lot of memorization. Of, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah before, the, before the stuff was written down, there was the oral tradition. In fact, it was after the time of Jesus that the Talmud was written the Talmud is actually the written record of the oral histories, but the job of the, of the clerics in those days, I mean, there were scribes in Jesus' time, and that's what a scribe was. He was a professional copyist. He's the one who copied stuff over, because you couldn't photocopy it. And so, but the oral traditions were so important to the Hebrew people that eventually they said, you know, this stuff is too valuable, and it's getting to be too much. <laughs> just to rely on memorizing it. So we've got to start writing this down. And that's what the Talmud was. You know, the Gemara and the Mishnah and the various other pieces of the Jewish Talmud were the writing down of the oral tradition. But in addition to that, they had always had the, you know, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh. Okay. Yes, Ron? Uh, the date for the... Uh, um, I can't remember. Septuagint? The, yeah, was that around 300? Three, third century BC. Okay. So it, it had been just under 300 years between the time the, that that was finished and the time of Jesus. So. <coughs> yes. Did anybody have a last name? <laughs> <laughs> Usually it was off. <laughs> um, you know, like um, the, the last name to differentiate people, because there were a lot of people with the same names, would either use, be who their father was, and it would be the son of, which is Bar. Okay, um, we're going to see um, Bartholomew. Bartholomew is the son of Toma, uh, Ptolemy. Okay, um, or it would be the town they're from. Um, like Judas Iscariot means Judas, uh, Judas of Carioth. And so the way they would differentiate people is by either using their, their uh, father, let's say they were the son of, like Johnson, the most common name in the world, the son of John. Amazing how that works, okay? Um, and so, and that's been typical because the idea of last names as being included is a fairly modern invention. People would usually have a name, and if there were a lot of people who had that name, they would add something else on. Um, sometimes it would be Little John, okay? Um, I had an uncle and a cousin both named Elwood. I learned, this is in East Tennessee. This is rural East Tennessee. This is no indoor plumbing. <laughs> And so my uncle was Big Elwood, and my, my cousin, his nephew, was Little Elwood. Did the little one got taller than the Actually, yeah, actually, you know, Big <laughs> Elwood was much smaller than Little Elwood. And yet that's very much the way they would do it back then. If they had people with the same name and they're in the same town or whatever, they would come up with some 
qualification, either they're the son of, or they came from somewhere else, or little and big, or you know that kind of thing. Um, but they didn't have multiple names back then. Okay? Um, again, that's a very modern tradition. And of course, here in Mexico, we've complicated it because they use the mother's name at the end, although that's not really their last name. It's okay. Oh, all the things we know. Um, another passage about the son of David from Mark 10. A blind man, Bartimaeus, that means son of Timaeus. There it is. I didn't even remember that was, that was the next passage we were looking at. Bar, son of Timaeus, Bartimaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now that passage could simply be a reference to the fact they were Jewish. It could be a recognition of the fact that they were descended from the line of David, which was the highest of honors in terms of, you know, they were the elite if you're descended from David. Or it could be a messianic statement. The idea that a son of David would sit on the throne as the Messiah. It could mean either of those things. In Bartimaeus' case, you know, it, it may have been a little bit, bit of all of that because he expected that the man could heal him the likelihood is he was saying he thought this was the Messiah, that there's something special going on here, okay? So, we have the Messiah, Christ. We have the Son of David. We also have the Son of Man. And this is the one that has caused more confusion than anything else, and it really shouldn't. Jesus' favorite name for himself was the Son of Man. He called himself that more than anything else. When the high priest said to him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? basically the Son of God, Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man. Now again, liberal professors back in the 1960s would always say, oh, Jesus never claimed to be God. He said he was the Son of Man, which basically just means he's human. Most of you have heard me talk about this before, so you know it's coming. Daniel 7. Daniel was one of the most popular books of the Old Testament. Uh, people knew it well. It was beloved uh, amongst the Jewish people. And in Daniel 7, uh, Daniel the prophet has a vision. He writes, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, which is my favorite name for God. He approached the Ancient of Days, and it was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That's what the Son of Man means. It does not just mean human, although it does also mean human. When In the vision, when Daniel has a sense of there appeared before me one like a Son of Man, he's saying... Like a son of man, he had the appearance of being a human man. And yet, he wasn't just a human man because this is what God gave to him. Everlasting dominion that will not pass away. A kingdom that will never be destroyed. All authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language will worship him. That's what it means to be the son of man. Yes, human, because Jesus was human. But way more than human. The reason why Jesus, I believe, used the title Son of Man is there actually was more expectation of power and authority because of Daniel's vision in the title Son of Man than there was in the title Son of God. Because people, uh, a lot of the prophets refer to themselves as the Son of God. And what they meant by that is child of God. Okay? Son of God, a daughter of God, a child of God. There's nothing particularly divine about that. And so, Son of God was more commonly used than Son of Man. When Jesus uses the title Son of Man, he's actually using a more elevated title in terms of what people would have understood from Daniel that title means. Now, that doesn't mean Jesus was not referred to as the Son of God, because the next title we have, Son of God... Mark 1, the first passage, first uh, verse in Mark says, The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And from John 11, Yes, Lord, she replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Now again, the Son of God title is, some, is one that people usually use to Jesus, talking to him or referring to him 
And when it's used in talking to Jesus, Jesus never corrects them. He doesn't go, oh, no, 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 no. No, that's too much. You know, that's not me. <laughs> you no. Know? He never does that. He accepts the declarations that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. Um, he never, he never uh, defers from those declarations by people. And yet his favorite name for himself, his favorite title for himself, is Son of Man. Because that would have been perceived by most people, most Jews who heard him as being more significant than any of the others. Yes? Well, you know, as, as Son of Man, he is something that God the Father is not. Because that's true. That's question. And so that's, a, you know, when you say the Son of God, well, he's, he's got the authority from God as God's Son, or he's, you know, co heir right. or co-equal. But when he is the Son of Man, that's an authority that... Only he has. There is included in that the incarnation. Yeah. The fact that he is God incarnate. Yeah. To be a son of man means to be human, which he was. Yeah. He was the incarnate son of God. Yeah. Um, so there is a uniqueness. That is a characteristic of, of the second person of the Trinity that neither of the other two persons, the Father or the Spirit, can claim. That they are you know, incarnate, human. Okay? <coughs> Questions about any of that? Do you understand the significance? And, and the fact that all of these titles are used for Jesus, I think, is important. Because each of them adds an aspect of significance to who Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, really was. That he was the fulfillment of Jewish expectation. He was the Messiah. That he was the fulfillment of the promise to David. He is the son of David. He was the one to whom all authority would be given, as Daniel declared. He was the son of man. And he truly was the divine second person of the Trinity come to earth and being the Son of God. He was all of those. And each one of those titles attribute a, a different, very significant aspect to who he was and what he represented. And there, there's another title, and that is Lord in Greek, Kyrios. Um, this actually, there are places in, in the New Testament where, and I'll give you one in a minute, where Jesus is called Lord, especially amongst Paul. But this, this uh, even beyond the New Testament, Kyrios, or Lord, became the most common title for Jesus in the early church. This was especially true because um, once the <coughs> Jewish, once the Christian faith spread beyond just Jewish Christians and moved out into Gentile Christians, this took on special significance. To the Gentile, um, whenever they were referring, like the pagan Gentiles, whenever they would refer to any other god, Zeus, Apollo, anything else, they would call that god Lord. Lord was a, a title for a divinity, a deity. Okay, um, And so, and as I say here, inherent in that were implications of deity, of pre-existence, of absolute lordship. They would use that for whichever god they were worshipping. When the... Christian faith spread from the Jewish church, Jewish Christian church, out to Gentiles, they began to use that title for Jesus in recognition of the fact he was the only one who really deserved to, to get that title. He was the only one who was truly Lord. None of these other pagan gods, none of the old gods deserved that, but Jesus did. And in particular, Kyrios, Lord, is Paul's favorite title for Jesus. He uses others as well, but this is the one that he mostly used, and especially he used it when he wrote to the Gentile churches. For instance, Romans 10, one of the great statements about how to be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, literally is Kyrios, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the belief and declaration that Jesus is Lord that he is God himself, pre-existent, absolute Lord of your life, and the Savior. Professing that and believing that he was resurrected is what saves you. And you'll notice it doesn't say anything about how you dress or whether you got submerged or sprinkled or anything else. Believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead and profess with your mouth that he is Lord. So that title, Lord, in Paul and amongst Gentile Christians especially, became very, very important. Because it meant deity. It meant God to so many of them. Okay, questions about those titles and their significance?
There were others that came along later. For instance, in the medieval times, Jesus became known as friend of sinners. You know, that's where the sort of gentle Jesus, sweet and mild kind of came in. Um, but, yes? When Jesus approached uh, Paul on, on his way to uh, go after the other Christians and he got knocked over, he didn't know it was Jesus, but he said, Lord, who are you? Who are you? Right. Knowing that this something divine just happened, that whatever this is, is some kind of God, some kind of creature beyond me, Paul's reaction was to call him Lord. Because that's what you call a God, or somebody who seemed to be a deity, even before he knew who it was. Lord, who are you? Exactly. Very good. All right, I want to turn now for the next few minutes and talk about... Um, all these notes. I just start talking and forget that I've even got notes up here. Um, I want to talk for a few minutes now about the relationship of Jesus to his disciples. Again, the idea being that between God the Father in heaven and the disciples on earth, Jesus was the bridge between the two. And so he had relationships in both directions, to the God the Father and to his followers on earth, both those who initially came to him in the first century and all those who have come to him over the 2,000 years since and to today. All right? So let's talk about Jesus' relationship to his disciples. This may be depressing to some of you to hear, but Christianity began as a young people's movement. Um, the early Christians, almost certainly, were all in their 20s. The reason we say that is because, um, well, there's several evidences of it. And when, when we look at, the Apostle Paul talks later about the witnesses to Jesus' resurrection, and he's writing quite a few years later, he says that of the 500 people to whom the risen Christ appeared, and I quote here from 1 Corinthians 15, the greater part of them remain unto the present. Well, unless they had been in their 20s, you know, Paul is writing 40 years later, it's unlikely the majority of them would still be alive, given how long people lived back then, unless they had been in their 20s when they experienced Jesus. Um, based upon the, the apostles themselves, we get a sense that this was mostly young people. Jesus himself was only 29, 30 when his ministry started. Um, and yet he would have been older than most of them. It's also true that frequently Jesus refers to his followers in the original Greek as techna, or the more intimate or, or affectionate diminutive technia, which is sort of like my dear children, or a good translation of it might be lads. Well, lads. So Jesus, at 29 or 30, is talking to his followers as people junior to him, and not just junior in terms of their spirituality or their understanding of God, but because they were younger than him. Um, and so we get this very clear sense that Christianity began as a young person's movement. And that's, that's consistent with the fact that all studies today have shown, and this is something I've run into in some of the consulting uh, work that I've done, they determined that if a person, if an if a individual does not accept Jesus by age 16 or 17, there's only a 1 in 7 chance that they ever will. The vast majority of people who are going to accept Jesus do so in their middle teens. Not later. That doesn't mean they can't get saved later. It just means that the odds go down the older you get. Um, this is why there are so many organizations who are very intentional. Young Life and Youth for Christ and, you know, some of the great organizations of the 20th century have oriented themselves toward high school students or early college students is because that's the time in which the majority of people who make a confirmed commitment to the faith, that's when they're going to do it. And we find that consistent with the ages of the apostles. It started as a young person's movement, and we have some pretty clear indication of that in Scripture. Okay. It's also true that the early disciples were an astonishing, diverse group, astonishingly diverse group, um, which was a powerful witness to the universality of Jesus' appeal. You look at just the 12 apostles, you have Matthew, a tax collector, who worked for the Roman officials, the oppressors, somebody that nobody would be seen with in public, sitting down at the table with Simon the Zealot, who we believe, based upon what he was called, would have been a member of the Zealot Party, who believed in violent overthrow of the Roman authorities. And these folks sit down together. And they, they travel together, and they're brothers in the faith. 
Um, there is, you've got, um, you've got Simon Peter, this loud, boisterous, you know, always got to say something, doesn't know how to keep his mouth shut. And scripture tells us that, you know, at the transfiguration, when, when they, when Peter, James, and John saw Jesus with Moses and Elijah, Peter says, Lord, why don't we build three tabernacles here for you? And then in parentheses it says, he didn't know what to say. They apologized for him blurting something out because he didn't have a clue what, what he should say. That was Simon Peter. Now he grew later, but initially during the time when he was called and that he was part of Jesus as close as 12, you've got the, the brashness of Simon Peter and you have the quietness of John, you know. John the Elder, as he became known later, as he got older, he was the youngest, as best we know, of all the apostles, and the one who lived longest, the only one who died a natural death in his 90s. He was quiet, soft-spoken. Even Andrew, Simon's brother, tended to be very gentle by all indications. It was Andrew, for instance, that when they needed to feed the 5,000, Andrew finds the little boy and brings him over and says, Well, Jesus, here's the little boy, and he's got some loaves and fishes. Okay, that's not the way Peter would have dealt with it. Okay, Peter would have said, get out of here, kid. What do you think we're going to do with that? Okay. Um, very different personalities, very different backgrounds. In such a way that you can't imagine them even getting along, much less the fact that they were joined together. And that is, uh, I think, a credit to the fact that all kinds of people heard Jesus preached and teach and saw him heal, and no matter where they were coming from, they were drawn to the same place with him at the center. Okay, so a huge diversity. I think we can also see that Jesus had two purposes in calling the twelve apostles. Now let me here define the difference between the disciple and apostle, because people get confused over that. When scripture talks about the disciples, a disciple is someone who follows. And there were many of those, everyone who accepted Jesus, believed he was who he said he was, and, and came to him and followed him and learned from him and listened to his teaching and all that. They were disciples. But early on in his ministry, Jesus specifically picks 12 after, after praying all night. He goes out to the mountain and he prays, and then he comes down and he selects 12 to be apostles. Now, whereas a disciple is someone who follows, an apostle is one who is sent Right? So an apostle is somebody who's been selected for ministry to be sent out to pursue the ministry. And Jesus had two purposes in calling the twelve apostles. The first one was to be his friends. For fellowship and for training. I think this is an example. Jesus was not married. Uh, he had family. But the idea that it's not good for a person to be alone extends beyond just marriage. It also extends to friendships, and Jesus desired to have his friends around him, both for fellowship and so he could teach them, so they could be his special students, and he could mentor them in very specific ways. It's also, the second reason is that he wanted to prepare them to be apostles, to be sent out. He wanted to prepare them to carry on the ministry and to establish the church. A passage that addresses both of these points is Mark 3. It says, he, Jesus, appointed twelve that they might be with him, there's the fellowship part, and that he might send them out, there's the apostle part, to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. So Jesus selected these twelve that he would have a group of friends that he could mentor and be close to and live with and train for fellowship and for preparation so that he could then send them out. It was these that he built the church on or on which he built the church, to get my grammar straight. Um, so those were the reasons he selected 12 especially, that they would be closest to him, learn from him, be his friends, and then be sent out to be the foundation for the church that was to come. And he called the apostles into three things, or in three ways you might say. He called them to friendship, he called them to following, follow me, that was actually the call that he used for several of the apostles. He would say, follow me. Or the, the first apostles were um, uh, Andrew and Nathaniel. I think, um, I think it was Nathaniel. Started following Jesus. They were followers of John the Baptist. And when John said, that's the one I was talking about, that Jesus, he is the one I was, I've, been, I've talked about all this time, the one that was coming. So they start following Jesus. And they're just follow, literally following him. 
And Jesus turns around and says, can I do something for you? And they went, uh, 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 we want to see where you're staying. And he said, well, come and see. So that idea of come was what Jesus often called him, follow me, and I'll show you. And then to full ministry, that is to prepare them for healing, for casting out demons, for preaching the good news, which are the things he prepared them for. And he gave them at least two opportunities, first just the 12 and then the 70, so there's more than just the 12 doing ministry, that he sent out to practice, and then to come back and report, and see how they did, okay? Any questions about that, sort of generally, about the apostles? Okay, let's, I want to look at the twelve, because they're an interesting group. There are, in, all, in four of the books, all three synoptic gospels, and in the book of Acts, there are lists of these people. Um, they, the lists don't all use the same names, and that was because sometimes people had multiple names. Sometimes they had nicknames. Okay, My family, they all call me Rusty. <laughs> there are people who are my relatives. If you said Ross, they wouldn't have a clue who you're talking about. Because they only know me as Rusty. My brother Perry is known as Buddy. My brother Charles is known as Jack. <laughs> the first time I, I can remember the first, and he's my older brother, I, somebody, the first time somebody said something about uh, his, his first wife, you notice I said first wife, his first wife um, said, well, Charlie this and Charlie that, and I'm thinking, who the heck is she talking about, Charlie? <laughs> I didn't even know my oldest brother's name was Charles, because he'd been Jack as long as I'd known him. Okay? The same thing is true with, with the, some of the apostles, and I want to just go through these. Um, get my notes here, because there's a couple of things I want to talk about then. First, of course, we do have Simon Peter. His name was Simon. Jesus gave him the name Peter, which literally means the rock, or more appropriately, probably, rocky. Um, that was a nickname that Jesus gave him. His name, um, the word for rock was, was Petros, very similar to what the Spanish word is for it. And he named him Peter, the rock. And he said, on this rock I will build my church. The most prominent of the twelve, the one who always had something to say, even before he really knew what he ought to say. Um, and he really was the leader of the apostles. He was the one who was willing to step into it. Now that in a positive sense and a negative sense. He was the one that, that both confessed Jesus, the great confession that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, um, the, uh, but he also was the one who said to Jesus, oh, don't stop talking like that. You know, don't tell us you're going to die. You can't do that. And Jesus had to rebuke him and say, get behind me, Satan. So he was always the one that was up front. But that um, forcefulness is how he was used. He was willing to step into things that other people might have been reluctant to, and because of that, he became the leader of the church. He was the one that stood up at Pentecost by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and when everybody else was saying, these people are all drunk, what's wrong with them? Somebody make them shut up. Peter stands up and says, you guys don't get it. It's only 9 in the morning. These people aren't drunk. Let me tell you what's going on here. If Peter had not had his personality, he might have been reluctant to do that, but that's who he was, and that's why he was the leader. Secondly, we have Andrew. Andrew, who was the brother of Simon Peter. He had been a follower, as I said a minute ago, of John the Baptist. And he's the one that brought his brother Simon to meet Jesus. He said, we have found the Messiah. Come and see. Um, he's also, as I said, the one who brought the boy with the loaves and fishes. And together with Philip, he's the one that brought a group of Greeks who sought out Jesus in John 12. Uh, Andrew and Peter were from, from Bethsaida. And apparently that's where um, you know, they had started a fishing uh, business. They were working out of Capernaum when Jesus met them. They were fishermen along with the next two, James and John. James and John were brothers. They were sons of Zebedee. And Jesus nicknamed them the Sons of Thunder, or Boanerges, it's called. The Sons of Thunder. We don't know if that's because, we think it's probably because their, their, their father Zebedee was, was loud. Okay. Uh, it may have been that it's because they were specially gifted or whatever, but we believe Sons of Thunder, Boanerges, is because Zebedee, you remember, the story is that when they started following Jesus, they were in the boat working with their father. Jesus called them, and they got out of their boat, left Zebedee and his hired, hired workers in the boat, and they took off. Well, uh, 
Zebedee may have had something very loud to say about that when they climbed out of the boat and started to walk away. We got work to do here. What's wrong with you? You know, get back over here. Well, they became the sons of thunder um, as fishermen. Now, Peter, James, and John were the inner circle of Jesus' closest disciples. They were the ones he was especially close to. When uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, it was Peter, James, and John, not Andrew. I always feel like Andrew got left out and shouldn't have. But Peter, James, and John were the ones who went to the Mount of Transfiguration. They were the ones that Jesus invited to come into the Garden of Gethsemane while he told the others to wait outside. Um, so those three were always especially close to Jesus. We then have Philip. Uh, Philip was also from Bethsaida. He's the one that introduced Nathaniel to Jesus. Um, we have Bartholomew, or son of Ptolemy, which probably was from the Greek Ptolemy. You've heard of Ptolemy the philosopher? Uh, maybe you haven't, but you should have. So um, it's believed, here's one where Bartholomew and Ptolemy, and um, the Bartholomew and Nathaniel are two names that don't line up in the list. Some of them say Bartholomew, some of them say Nathaniel. We think that he probably uh, had two names, that he was called both. And he's named one in one place and one in another. Just like if I knew, you know, if my family wrote a story, I was mentioned in a list of relatives, they would call me Rusty. If somebody who wasn't a relative was writing about this list of people, they would call me Ross. And you go, is this two different guys or what? Well, we think that Bartholomew and Nathaniel are the same person. Then we have Matthew. Um, Matthew, who is traditionally understood, and I believe, was the author of the first of the Gospels, the most Jewish of the Gospel writers. He's identified in Mark as the tax collector who is called Levi, so sometimes he's referred to as Matthew Levi. Um, and he represented a lot of important things with regard to people's expectations of Jesus. Because he was a tax collector and Jesus called him as an apostle, that, that was one of the clear indications that Jesus was not going to be the kind of Messiah they expected. Because he wasn't fighting against the Romans, he was inviting the people who were siding with the Romans to follow him. And that didn't sit very well with people. Okay? So we have Matthew the tax collector. Then, Thomas. Thomas, who was known as Didymus, Didymus means twin, so apparently he had a brother or sister out there somewhere. He was a twin. Um, he is best known as Doubting Thomas, which is really a bum rap, okay? Um, Thomas was not present when Jesus first appeared to the other apostles. And when they're all telling him, Thomas, Thomas, Jesus is alive, he's alive. And Thomas goes, what? Come on. I'll believe that when I see it. All Thomas was asking for was the same thing everybody else had already gotten, and that is a personal experience of the resurrected Jesus. When he did see the resurrected Jesus, Jesus said, Thomas, put your finger in my hands and your hand in my side and see that it's me. Thomas didn't do that. He fell on his knees and said, my Lord and my God. Okay, great witness. And Thomas traveled, the tradition is that he traveled all the way to India to plant the gospel. Um, and most of these people have, have, at least by reputation, now it became very important, for those of you in church history, you've heard this, it became very important for churches to claim apostolic origin. You know, they, became, they were thought of as more important as a church if they could say, we were founded by an apostle. So, some of these apostles traveled unbelievably. <laughs> you know, like James, the brother of John, who was the first of the martyred apostles, died very early. Uh, is supposed to have gone all the way to Spain and planted the church, and then come all the way back, and then been martyred. And then they took all of his bones back because Compostela de Santiago, Santiago is, is uh, Spanish for James, the Compostela de Santiago in Spain is the number two site of Christian pilgrimages in the world after Rome because that's supposedly where James was buried. After visiting there, heading back, you know, and he must have really been flying. You know, those buses must have been, you know, <laughs> just zipping. Anyway, so uh, Thomas is most often called Doubting Thomas, is known as the one who doubted the resurrection until he himself saw Jesus. Then we have another James, James the son of Alphaeus. He's called James the Lesser, or sometimes James the Younger, in order to differentiate him from James the brother of John. There are two Jameses in here. And again, you get Bar Joseph, uh, or Bar Alphaeus, I mean. Um, it's possible that this James, James the Lesser, was the brother of Matthew, because they both have a father named Alphaeus, which wasn't that common a name, and so they may be brothers. There was a lot of family ties in this stuff. Then we have Thaddeus. 
Thaddeus is, is listed in another place, a.k.a. Uh, Levius, or Judas the son of James. This is the most disputed of the name, the one that we're at least uh, sure about because there's, it's sort of at this slot in the list, there's three different names used. Uh, one place is called Thaddeus, one place we believe it's the same person called Labius, another place Judas the son of James. Um, but we believe that they're probably either names or nicknames for the same person. Then Simon the Canaanian, or Simon the Zealot, we often know him as. Canaanian is actually an Aramaic term, which means the zealous one. We believe he was a part of, uh, part of the zealot party that believed in the violent overthrow of the Roman, uh, Roman oppressors. And then finally, of course, Judas Iscariot, uh, whose betrayer of Jesus. Iscariot probably means the man from Kerioth, which was a region in Judea. That's why Judas is, is believed to be the only one of the followers of Jesus that was not from Galilee. They were all from the north, all Galileans, except for Judas. Now, I've heard an interesting theory that Judas Iscariot's name isn't actually uh, from Kerioth. It's Judas Iscari. It's the Iscari were dagger men. They also were zealots. They were, uh, they were uh, militant revolutionaries. And so if he was one of the dagger men, which would have been one of the zealots, then he and, and uh, if that's true, he and Simon would both have been members of the zealot party. All right? Questions about those? Yes? I wonder if Simon was the one that threw the sword and cut off the ear. Uh, they believe it was Simon Peter, yes. In well, fact, Simon it says Peter. that. They believe it was Simon Peter. In one place it says Simon drew a sword. In one of the Gospels, I think it's... Um, but the zealot might be likely to have a sword. Right? Well, it's true. Yeah, um, the zealot. Yeah, the, the, I think it does tell us Peter did it at one place. It was, and that, that was the same place that says that the servant, it was Malthus who was the servant of the high priest, that he cut his ear off and Jesus healed him. Yeah. And if Jesus hadn't healed him, then the guards might have arrested Simon and everybody else there. And the reason why Jesus called them down and said, no, no, those who live by the sword, die by the sword, don't do that, and he healed the ear, is because then there weren't any grounds for them to arrest the rest of them. Because Jesus had told them, you know, I don't want you guys involved in this, okay? Um, anything else? I'll just spend the last few minutes, bless you, the last few minutes blessing you, uh, talking about the divinity of Jesus. There are still people who say, well, Jesus was a great guy, he was a great teacher, but he wasn't really the son of God. Well, Paul talks about that. It says if Jesus was not resurrected from the dead, the great miracle that proved his divinity, then uh, we are to be pitied above all people for believing. First, I believe scripture is clear that Jesus was God incarnate, and I have several verses up here, and again, I do this, you can go online and all of this stuff is available to you uh, to pull down. 1 John 1, 4 said, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Anointed One. Of course, we also have John 1, which says, in the beginning, from, the, from eternity, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the same was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And it goes on down and says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have witnessed His glory. That Jesus is co-eternal with the Father. Okay? So, Scripture testifies that Jesus was and is God incarnate. Secondly, we have the testimony in Matthew and Luke that Jesus was born of a virgin in fulfillment of the Old Testament. That doesn't happen every day. Right, Dr. Bob? <laughs> As a medical doctor, you can tell us you know, virgins don't usually give birth to babies. That's a pretty unusual circumstance. We also believe that, G that Jesus was the divine creator. Again, I just quoted from John 1, uh, through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. We also have Colossians 1, which says the Son is the invisible, I'm sorry, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That's Colossians 1, 15 to 17. And then, the idea that Jesus is Lord. Again, Paul used Lord as his favorite title for Jesus. From Philippians, I read you Romans 10, 9 a minute ago, but from Philippians, therefore God exalted him, that's Jesus, to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, 
and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, people can say they don't believe what's in Scripture. That's everybody's right. But people who say that Jesus never claimed to be divine, when he said to the high priest, when he was asked, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? He said, I am. When he never denied it, when somebody else made those claims to him, to his face, when he claimed that he could forgive sins, that he had authority over the law and the Sabbath, when he, that what you thought about him would make a difference in your eternal uh, destination, the fact that he would be the judge at the end of all time, that he could forgive sins, that he cast out demons, that he drove out diseases, that he raised the dead. Now, you cannot believe all of that if you want to, but to claim it doesn't say that is just not very bright. And yet that's what people do. You don't have to believe it, but don't claim it's not in there, because it is. And, you, and the weight of evidence in so many different ways is very compelling. So reject it if you want, but don't, you know, be clear of the fact that it does say that Jesus was all these things, that he claimed all these things for himself, and he clearly was recognized and acclaimed by other people as being the Son of Man with all authority for all time, the Son of God uh, from each, all eternity co-equal with the Father, the, the Messiah who would fulfill all the Jewish expectations, and on and on. Okay? Questions about any of that? Oh. Yeah. Um, I had facetiously uh, in my career I did see several virgin births. So it's okay. not, it's not that <laughs> yeah, but usually there's only one person testifying to that, right? <laughs> <laughs> we had a few more than that. Okay. Yeah, Would you restate the one in seven uh, statistic you right. made? Right, a statistic I've heard quoted. I didn't do the research myself, <laughs> but that is that if, if, a, a, per, if a child, a person, does not accept Jesus by age 16 or 17, mid-teens, there's less than a 1 in 7 chance that they will later. Okay? That's the, that's the critical importance of reaching out to people young. And it's not just because they're... It's, there may be, one reason may be because you get much older than that and other things crowd in. The idea of the, like the parable of the sower of the soils, you know, the thorns that crowd out uh, the truth of the gospel. Um, there's an openness and a willingness to listen and a lack of cynicism at that age that, that creeps in later. Um, so, other questions or comments? All right, thank you very much.